Greetings, welcome to Learn to Burn Studios. In today's video, we're going to talk about the myths or misconceptions that surround the use of ceramic shell with lost wax casting. And whether that's uh, a one-man shop, small foundry, schools, um, or just the, the DIY home caster um, working out of their garage or their backyard. I really want to break down the, the why I feel that anyone can actually utilize ceramic shell. But there's a lot of anxieties that kind of go, you know, people have this, these perceptions about what goes into using ceramic shell. And it keeps them from actually taking advantages of being able to cast thinner, get higher detail, and get, have more consistent castings. And with that said, let's get started. So the first three myths I want to talk about really kind of go hand in hand, but we're going to talk about them as three distinct things. One of the first you know, myths or misconceptions is that people have this perception that ceramic shell can only be utilized in large scale foundry situations. And one of the, you know, the characteristics of these larger foundries is that one, that they have a lot of equipment, that they need a lot of equipment, and whether that be specialized kilns, large mixing vats uh, for the slurry itself, uh, these automated uh, stucco um, applications, um, whether they're uh, fluidized beds that allows you to get even coverage or a rainfall system, which is essentially a giant tumbler that as you know, spray and sand around and then you stick your pattern in and you get this nice even coat. And, and th those devices are great, but they're not necessary in this, the scale and the application of what we wanna do as a small scale foundry. Um, there are plenty of ways and some other tricks that we can work around, you know, the, not having access to some of this equipment and still get the desired results and take advantage of the premium results that we can get with ceramic shell. I mean, along with this list of equipment that people th think they need are large vats or these dedicated, you know, lightning mixers. You know, we can get away with utilizing, you know, a, a cut down 55 gallon barrel or a trash can or even a five gallon bucket is suitable enough to be able to mix at least a small amount of slurry or at least to work out of. You know, what I've found that, you know, when it comes to mixing, it's nice to at least start off with a trash can, get a decent volume mixed up, and then you parse it down into a five gallon bucket that winds up being easier for, to maintain or to move in your foundry area. One of the other, you know, things that people have this, mis you know, this, this idea is that they need these special kilns for burnout. You know, again, it's like when you have the larger equipment, certainly it makes life nicer and stuff like that, but it's not a prerequisite to be able to do this style of, of investment. You know, other options instead of using a you know, larger kiln and stuff like that is to, you know, you can get away with just, you know, something that's made out of brick or adobe or even a simple layer of K wool sticking a burner in it, something with an open bottom so the wax can drain out. You can even get, you know, some other methods for uh, dealing with your burnout, actually boil your shells out. You can, you know, literally, you know, get, get a giant crock pot or something you'd boil, you know, you'd cook a turkey in boil up some water, throw your shell into that. The wax is going to go ahead and melt and leach out and float to the surface. Now with that system, you still need to be able to take that shell out after it's been de-waxed and stick it into a, some sort of kiln situation uh, so you can vitrify your shell or at least be able to blast it with multiple burners to harden, vitrify, or, or basically bisque fire uh, your shells. The simplest method of, of all, it's not the best, but it, it, but it does work, is actually literally just taking uh, a weed burner, propane torch, and starting at the cup, work your way up, let that wax you know, uh, slump out of the, of the shell, and then work your way up into your spruce system and gating, and then ultimately the pattern, and allow everything to evacuate. It's a little bit messier, it's a lot slower, but again, it, but it is, it, it's still a very feasible, doable, as a way to de-wax your shells. You know, again, that's not maybe not necessarily the ideal way, but it's certainly a very feasible way to actually melt the wax out without actually investing into a large kiln, specifically for burnout. And then ultimately the idea that we need these special mixers. You'll hear, hear the term of a, a lightning mixer, which is traditionally used, high intensity, high torque, uh, continuous motor. And again, they're really great, but they're a thousand bucks a pop at least. You know, you can get away with using a simple old drill press but you can also get it with hand mixers or, or a hand mixer that's mounted. Now again, when we're doing our initial mix, you do want to be mixing it for a couple of hours or, or overnight 
And so obviously having, you know, instead of just standing there with your hand mixer, you do want to be able to, you know, mount that or like I said, a drill press or something. A lot of times, especially if we're using a, some sort of suspension agent, you can get away with setting your slurry off to the side and just using a hand drill to kind of fluff it up and get it ready before each dip. The second myth is that you, you need to be part of a large foundry. And part of that's because you, this is premise, obviously you need all this equipment. But also the other aspect of a large foundry is that because they're larger, they're, they're, they have a, a greater ability to absorb those costs and that, that equipment, as well as a large foundry also provides, you know, the, the aspect that you have uh, a larger crew and that you have uh, trained individuals specifically for that only work in the wax room or only work in shell or only chase metal. But the reality is, is that the most efficient foundry workers are the ones that can actually do everything. Everyone is more than capable to learn all those tricks and nuances and subtleties and you know, craftsmanship intent and uh, work ethic to be able to start from nothing and finish with a, a great metal casting. The, the third component or third myth um, in this category is the idea that um, using ceramic shell is expensive. Now granted, there was a time when you could only buy the materials in 55, the colloidal in 55 gallon drums or your flowers and stucco, you could only buy them in quantities of, of, of a pallet, 30, 40 bags at a time. That could easily run between the pallets and, and, the, and the drum of colloidal, it could easily be a couple thousand dollars. And so it was really tough for people to kind of get over that hurdle, specifically if you're a small scale foundry and or in a school situation. But the silica companies now have realized the need and the, uh, and, and the large volume of small scale casters that they're w willing to actually sell smaller quantities. You can get colloidals in uh, five gallon uh, increments or individual 50 pound bags of your stuccos or your flowers. Part of the thing that kind of goes along with, with, with the idea that it's expensive is that it takes more time and of course time is money. But the reality is, is that the ceramic shell is going to give you a better quality casting. Even though the, the duration or how long it might take you actually do the shell, which might, might take you a couple of days to be able to dip up shell and get it burnt out and ready for metal. And say standard investment or sand casting, you can do in a matter of hours or a day, but you're going to have a lower quality casting that you're going to spend more time cleaning up in metal. By using ceramic shell, yes, you might spend a little bit more up front than you might typically do for a bag of plaster and sand for standard investment, but you're going to get that higher quality casting that's going to save you a lot more time in the later steps of the process. <sighs> okay, so we've gotten the first three out of the way. The fourth myth that we want to talk about is that people have the, you know, have this perception that shells leak a lot. And as a result, they bury them in sand. A lot of these preconceptions about ceramic shell are holdovers, old school thoughts from previous investments, whether it be standard investment or, or sand casting, whether it's resin bonded or green sand. People kind of immediately kind of go down this route. I mean, realistically, casting's casting and investments in general leak, whether it be sand, standard, or in our case, ceramic shell. But if done, you know, if, if, if you take some time, take a moment and do your shells correctly, and more specifically, if you burn out in a, proper, you know, in a decent way and are mindful about, you know, getting the wax out and vitrifying your shells, and as long as, we, you know, long as our, our shells are prepared in a consistent manner, they'll be more than appropriate to be able to handle metal that, you know, and, and your, for your shells not to leak. People have no faith in the material because they haven't actually really seen it done correctly. A lot of people out there that are doing shell and stuff like that are doing it poorly, doing it wrong. And so it sets this, this preconception that, that this is the way the material behaves. But meanwhile, with just a couple of simple tricks, and, and, and not, not tricks, but consistencies and practices within you know, applying ceramic shell to our patterns, you can get consistent molds that won't leak. You know, typically, I mean, sure, I might have a shell that leaks now and again and everything, but I'll easily have two, 20 or 30 shells in between each leak, or, or longer for that matter. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of it's coming from old school expectations of previous knowledge or again, people being, you know, people only seeing shell that's being uh, been done for by people that don't know what they're doing. 
And then fundamentally, you know, one of the things that ultimately leads, you know, aside from just applying the shell, what really leads to leaks is actually a misunderstanding of, of what, what it takes to burn out a shell, to de-wax, to, to get your pattern material out. And wh whether it's wax or PLA uh, or anything else that's combustible. And realistically, as we do an appropriate shell, as we get our burnout, we, we check on it, we get it all patched up and ready to go, typically you don't have to burn, it's, idea, it's even better if you don't bury them in sand. So typically what I'll do is I'll actually hang my shells in a rack um, over my pour pit and as I pour them, because it's like one of the things, you know, ultimately it is casting, things do leak occasionally. So, but if I, if I have a leak, I want to be able to see the leak and I want to be able to fix the leak. You know, and whether that's with, you know, a, a cold rod or a little bit of green patch or something to be able to freeze off that metal and continue the pour. I don't want to be, you know, knowing that I see my metal disappearing into the shell. I know there's, there's a leak happening, but at the same time, I can't do anything about it because I can't see what's going on. Okay, so fifth myth is that ceramic shell is not appropriate for some metals. Realistically, you can, you can put any kind of metal you want into a shell. Again, it's like going, we're gonna tweak the process a little bit to get the best behavior out of whether we're doing aluminum or bronze or iron. But one of the hangups uh, that comes up the most is uh, people trying to cast iron. And that the idea that if you're doing, specifically if you're trying to do a hollow casting. So one of the common, one of the common issues that people might have and specifically with working with iron is that if they're trying to do a hollow casting, is you know, and especially if their core has a, a decent amount of mass to it, um, is that their iron cracks. One of the ultimate realities is that the more heat we apply to a metal to, to get it liquid, obviously aluminum is only about 1600 degrees, it's gonna expand a certain amount, bronze 2000, maybe a little bit more. Iron, we're heating up to 25, 2600 degrees, so it expands quite a bit. And so when it comes time to actually cool that shell, cool the metal, it's going to contract quite a bit and if the, the, the at that point if we're doing a, a thin wall casting in this situation our the ceramic shell is actually stronger than the iron and so as the iron is trying to contract it's going to hit sufficient amount of resistance to that core material and that's what ultimately cracks the iron people have this perception that iron or, or metals in general are, are super tenacious and strong and whatnot but like iron yeah, you think of a hub or a hubcap. Uh, you think of a manhole cover. Sure, that's almost indestructible, but it's also two inches thick. But if we start dealing with you know certain metals and smaller thicknesses, they do become more potentially become more fragile in, in, in certain states. So one of the ways we can work a way around this is that if our if the shell is, itself is is too strong, we make the shell a little weaker. And one of the ways we could simplest ways we could do that is have less layers on the inside. Now I know that inherently if you have a pattern and you're submersing it into your tank of slurry, the slurry is gonna go everywhere, inside and out, and you're gonna wind up with even thickness on both the inside and the outside of the cast or the pattern. But what we can do is get away with actually, you know, it's like do a full dip and then every other dip, actually paint your slurry on the outside, only on the outside and on the gating system. By eliminating just a couple of layers in your core material, when the iron has is, is ready to contract, it will collapse the core sufficiently enough that it doesn't crack the iron. You'll also notice some similar tendencies sometimes in aluminum, just because aluminum is also inherently brittle at its, when it's a thinner thickness. You typically don't have this issue with bronze because bronze, because of its copper content, it's a much more plastic material and it, it has, can create its own resistance enough that it will uh, win the battle over uh, the ceramic shell. Six myth or misconception is going to be revolve around the idea that you can't cast tiny and you can't cast big. And so to break those down, I mean, the idea, so typically if, if you're doing rings or pendants and you know, something small scale, high detail, you know, you're using a, a mechanical assist of some sort, you know, whether it's a vacuum uh, casting or centrifugal casting. Uh, castings to help draw the metal into those nooks and crannies because our molds are small and there's not, a ch not, not enough chance to really get any kind of velocity, any kind of head pressure into those, those, those smaller molds, so we use mechanical assist. However, with ceramic shell, what we can do is that we can 
you know, we have our maybe our initial little bundle or tree of our patterns. But then for our gating, we can extend our cup up to maybe say a foot higher. And so we go from our cup to a, a one inch gate, three quarter inch, half inch gate, then quarter inch down into our, our button in our tree. It will, but the velo it'll increase the velocity. And by the time it gets down to your pattern, it's literally squirted in that metal and it to, it'll sufficiently capture all the uh, details and subtleties and thin qualities um, of your castings. So really the scale of your castings really isn't an issue on that level. And then the other issue is that people have this idea that we can't cast big. Well, you know, or the idea that you can't cast a pattern. It's like, well, if it doesn't fit in the tank, then you can't cast it. The idea, you know, that the, the premise is that the ideal way or the only way to dip a shell is to literally dip it into the volume so it's completely covered. And again, that's great if you're in that situation, but if you're, say, working out of a five gallon bucket and you're trying to cast a a milk crate or you know a torso or you know whatever your object is what you can actually do is you can get away with painting onto a surface applying that stucco then working to another another part of that piece you can work over to it to another area paint it on stucco it and kind of work your way like a quilt or patchwork over that surface and then and then you know set it off and let it dry and then when you come back for the next dip next layer of shell you do a similar patchwork, but in, in different ways. So your, your, your patches overlap, you know, the seams from a previous patch. And you just keep going through that process. And then ultimately that will give you a very uniform shell that, you know, so you can, you know, work bigger, um, even out of a five gallon bucket. So really, you know, size really doesn't come into play either. So yes, we can cast big, we can cast small, anything in between. The number one myth misconception, anxiety-driven, you know, dogma, weirdness that people get hung up on about ceramic shell is this premise that it always needs to be suspended. But more specifically, that you can't let it not be suspended. I know, a little complicated, I understand. So what I'm saying is that people have this idea that once it settles, that you're done. You gotta toss your shell out, it's a 100% it's a loss, and you're, there's, there's no way to recover from it. And so with that in mind, people typically have their mixer set up on timers. And so it's either, you know, say five minutes on, five minutes off, or two minutes on, 10, eight minutes off, you know, something in that, that level and stuff. So it's constantly, you know, before, by the time the stuff starts to settle, it's gonna fluff it back up. It's gonna kind of go through the scenario. But then if you have a power outage or um, a mechanical issue with your mixture or, uh, or more simply, if you're in a student situation and someone, you know, they turn off the mixer to do their dip, but then they forget to turn the mixer back on and walk away, then the slurry settles out. Those situations are unfortunate, and we'll talk about, you know, a solution for that in a, in a second. But first, the, the, the initial premise is that that slurry, once it settles, is, is, is toast is incorrect. The way that the shell is, is that if it settles, as long as it stays wet, you know, so, you know, the one thing about ceramic shell is once it goes dry, it's a water impermeable substance, meaning that it's not gonna dissolve in water. You know, we don't wanna get it to that point, but as long as your vat or, you know, or your, your, your slurry bin, whether it be the bucket or trash can or a barrel, sealed enough that it's, it's still heavily hydrated, it's, it's still wet, it's still gonna allow you to, you know, resuspend it. Now, as far as the headache, if you know someone's you know left the mixer off, the power went out, there was a mechanical issue with the mixer, you know those kind of situations. You know the the, the challenging with resuspending the mixer is that it's a real challenge if your mixing blade is still in the middle of the mix, and so the first first wrinkle is trying to get that out. Now, one way we work our way around in lessening the impact of this situation is to actually add an additive to the slurry that changes the viscosity of the water so the sand particles don't settle and pack as tightly. One possible additive is bentonite, which is a trick from uh, glaze formulation or in, in ceramics. You know, ceram a ceramic glaze is literally just sand and water, similar to our slurry. You know, one of the ways to do that is you add bentonite, change the viscosity. Um, another additive is a seaweed-based um, product called Sea Spend that has a similar effect on the water. And then there are uh, some other more commercial proprietary uh, agents 
or, or formulations that you can add to your slurry. Adding a suspension agent does is it gives you the advantage that it's easier to fluff your tank back up. If I have a, you know, say a, a, a trash can or even a five gallon bucket full of slurry that's fully settled without any additives, it could easily take me the better part, you know, several hours, if not the better part of the day to get that, you know, resuspended. But if I have, you know, bentonite or C-spin or some other suspension agent added to my slurry, it allows me to fluff up that volume of mixture um, in a fraction of the time, half the time. It's always, you know, it's, it's ideal to actually add those to your mixes regardless, just to give you that flexibility, you know, and it really adds to the ability to be able to feasibly set your slurry off to the side in between, you know, castings and let your slurry sit for weeks or a month at a time. If you're in a school situation, if you're running a, a foundry program and you're running foundry for the full semester, that's great. But a lot of times in a, in a you know, if it's just, just a sculpture one, one class or whatever, the foundry itself might, only, or a ceramic shell might only be a small, a two week component of a full semester syllabus. So you don't want to be, you know, having your slurry be mixing for the full, you know, 10 weeks or 15 weeks. You can resuspend it, utilize it for, for, for those couple of weeks, then shut it back down and be able to come back to it at a later date. The, the overall mindset that your slurries, you know, can settle, will you know keep you from a lot of you know sleepless nights um, and worrying about you know during a thunderstorm if the light you know if the power is going to go out or or, or the mixer is going to fail or whatever these or or if, some, or if a student forgets to flip the mixer back on taking that anxiety out of the mix will make your overall foundry practice much more pleasurable <laughs> i'm not a full-time foundry i do a lot of fabrication 3d work printing um, and scanning and all these other aspects of it so but when i need to cast I wanted to have my, my material ready, but instead of having my mixer running 24-7, 365, I'll shut it down for weeks or months at a time. Pull my mixing blade out, and then when I can go back in and say, well, that I'll use a hand drill with a short, shorter blade on it. I can fluff up, or you know, it's like on re kind of suspend at least the middle of the tank enough that I can then reintroduce my mixing blade with my, you know, my drill press, resuspend you know, the top part of the tank, and then I'll put in a longer blade, and, and then a longer and longer blade until I get my full-size blade in, and then I can ultimately resuspend the tank. If it's been only been a, a couple of weeks, it might fluff, the whole thing might fluff back up in an hour or so. If it's been sitting for a couple of months, typically what I'll do is I'll let it mix overnight, so I have, you know, I know everything's fully wetted. You know, so that's the, that, that's the key prep. The key thing is that going, yes, we can let our slurry settle, and we can resuspend them. You know, it, it's a challenge, but it, it's, it's a straightforward, consistent process. Very rarely are you ever in a situation where you're gonna just outright lose material, lose your investment, which takes us back to uh, the earlier myths talking about the expense of a material. So that's the seven major myths that really create hangups and anxiety. It really stops people in their tracks and keeps them from using ceramic shell in their small scale foundry practices. If, if there are other things that are keeping you from trying ceramic shell that I haven't covered in this video, please leave the comments below. If you found this video specifically helpful, please hit the like button. If you're digging the content and want to see uh, the, the continuation of this, we're working our way through all the different steps. The next videos I'm going to talk about uh, mixing and then ultimately dipping and reinforcement, burnout, fixing the shells. And so we're gonna really cover all the nuances, all the information that's not readily available. So with that said, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hit the notification bell so you're aware of when you know, I'm uploading videos. I'm trying to get things up on a weekly basis. And as always, until the next video, be creative and be safe.